Howdy, howdy, y'all. Welcome back to Semantics. It is another lovely Tuesday, and it's great to be back here with you all. Um, I am joined today by the one and only Ashley Boyer. Ashley, how's it going? It's going well. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you on. I've been following you for... There is no... There is no good way to say I've been following you for a while now, is there? Um, no, but like you consistently put out some fantastic accessibility uh, blog posts and you've been uh, a while back. You did some streaming of your own. Um, I'm super excited to have you on. Um, actually, kind of before we dive into what it is we're doing today, would you uh, like to introduce yourself for uh, anyone who, who might not have seen you around? Yeah, so I'm Ashley. I am from Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, that's in my little Twitter bio there. I'm a front end developer and I just started, um, got into my fourth year of working full time. So I have a software engineering degree, uh, from a small school in Terre Haute, Indiana. And probably no one has heard of that because they have never heard of it. Except when people are like, oh, I've driven through there when I've driven through Indiana. And I'm like, of course, yeah, that's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. It's fine. I'm not offended. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, so I actually originally was going to be a chemical engineer, and then I wasn't very good at it, so I tried out software, and I love it, and, like, I never anticipated getting into web development, mm -hmm. because in college, they teach you stuff, like, at least where I went, a lot of Java stuff, um, yeah. but I'm really glad that I just kind of, like, fell into web development, and then kind of sort of fell into web accessibility, like, I just happened to have a cool teammate that taught me about, like, screen readers and stuff, and then I was just, like, immediately i love it i love learning about it mm -hmm. and love talking about it so all right well uh yeah i didn't realize you were a a or studying to be a chemical engineer at first that's that's really cool um i came in to college undecided um and when i uh when i eventually landed on it took me like a whole year to land on computer science for my degree and when I announced that that was what I was doing, basically everyone in my communities were like, yeah, Ben, we know. <laughs> so, I love that. I didn't even know that programming was a thing oh, until wow. I got to college, really. Like, it, I mean, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that, like, computers were just magic. I just didn't know how to code. Yeah. So I was 19. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Well, uh... Right now, we are not looking at any screens, but I think I'm going to go ahead and just start showing screens um, just so that, first of all, we can show off Ashley's Twitter. Go follow Ashley on Twitter if you if you aren't already. Um, consistently great accessibility advice. Um, Ashley, you also blog. Thank you. Here's, here's, your, here's your blog. Go subscribe to that. Um, and you've probably got an RSS feed. Um, I'm, I'm I do. Back. Very recent, actually. Like a month and a half oh. or two ago. You know what? Thanks to, uh, it is kind of right there, but yeah. <laughs> it's very recent. Um, thanks to Sarah uh, Sweden. As oh. I think that's how you say your name. Yeah. Um, yes. So she put together, actually, let me find that too. Um, uh, RSS. She put together a, a thing that was like, here's some advice for how do you make a website that um that actually like works well in an rss reader um where here we go i'll put that in the chat as well um i don't know like rss is one of those things where i'm always like i feel like i should do this and i do have it on my blog but i i never really know how many people are actually reading content with rss but mm -hmm. maybe i need to actually explore consuming rss content um more you know maybe maybe that would be it yeah issue. i think you would find yourself surprised at how many people use them because i definitely was okay i was like rss it's not like people still use it because i thought <laughs> people did and then they mm -hmm. do yeah no uh I've, i'd always heard the sentiment that like rss died when google reader died like what is that like a decade ago now um but i don't know rss is making a uh resurgence um, okay, so I've got one last tab up. Staysemantic.com. Uh, what is this? It is going to be um, a collection of demos of different kinds of elements and like uh, do's and don'ts, essentially, that um, 
they probably won't be framed that way. They're going to be more like, here's what happens if you add this attribute. Here is why that's not helpful. And here's why something else is more helpful and gives you more context of uh, what an element, like how an element is semantically presented. So stay semantic. I, I can't remember which tweet it was. But I added a hashtag that said stay semantic folks or something. And it was supposed mm. to be like a cutesy little sign off. And then um, I think it may have been Anna Cook that said it. Like, uh, it sounds like a book title. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, I think I have like a catchphrase now. So then I bought a domain as uh, we developers do. Yeah. It's kind of, it's like, ah, yeah, it's like, eight dollars twelve dollars whatever i'll just buy it <laughs> so that is how this was born like from some funny tweets mm -hmm. and that's the plan because i think that's what a lot of people are interested in um or at least what i get asked about a lot like what happens if i change this attribute um and that's kind of what we're going to get into today but i wanted to have stuff available that people could actually play around with yeah First of all, I can totally relate to being a domain name driven developer. Um, I came up with the name <laughs> Some Antics um, and I got Some Antics Dev. And then I was like, wait, I actually need to do something with this now. And that's how the, the Twitch stream came about was like, I needed a good project to come with a great domain name. So, right. Uh, right. That was kind of like more how this was. I was like, I don't know exactly what I want to have here. But I've developed it since, yeah. and I've been working on it and polishing. And well, I'm actually not at the polish phase; more like polishing the idea. There we go. <laughs> not necessarily the pages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask a, a, a question. I think this is going to be a, a broad one, but I'm I'm very curious to get your insights here. Um, why do we care about semantics, and how I guess do like what what is the the process of semantics like what does that mean to you actually first of all maybe maybe i'll start with with a different question what does semantic markup mean to you semantic markup to me is like having the skeleton of a page like i don't even think about um styles a whole lot at least css specific i do think about layout for sure, because it's definitely important um, when it comes to like the ordering of your headings and how you nest them and all of that. <clears throat> and you know, a typical website where you have the nav bar at the top or something like that, which is super common. Um, so like basic patterns of layouts that you think about. Um, mm -hmm. But when I think of semantic markup, I'm only thinking about the HTML and um, using elements as they were intended to be used is a really big one. And then where there are gaps and you don't have a specific element for everything, because when you start building widgets or components, whatever you call them, um, you are putting things together to make a composite thing. That's where the name component comes from. And sometimes there are gaps there where the semantics aren't there. And at that point, after you've tested it, you don't want to reach for ARIA stuff first. The ARIA is uh, what you can add to your elements that you're making into a component and that adds semantics so that it behaves the way you want it to behave. And I'm often mostly thinking about this from a screen reader perspective because, um, you know, visually you can see something even if underlying it's not... Um, exactly what you might expect it to be. You can see things that, that you can have a different experience with with a screen reader. So that's mostly the perspective I'm thinking about. Okay. And I often sit and um, think, if I have my eyes closed, what do I want this to say to make sure to give this an accurate representation of what's actually on the page and what happens or what is happening when I perform actions on this page? That's often how I try to think about it. Okay, so yeah, you're 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 coming up with the the experience, even like divorced from the visual appearance of this, but rather you're describing like the functionality or or how I want this to be announced to assistive technologies. Hmm. Very cool. Um, yeah, so there are something like a hundred different HTML tags I want to say, right? Um, 
and they they all it, it seems like they all have their own like particular use cases right and, and sometimes those can feel very hyper specific um so uh i would love to explore your process for uh determining which semantics to use in which different cases um so let's go ahead and dive into that you have given me a code pen that we're going to be working off of um and yeah i guess where's the best place to start with this Okay, so um, we can start with how I chose what demos that I wanted to put in here. Um, and I forgot to mention in the context of this, actually, I think the tweet that I had that had the hashtag stay semantic, um, I think it was probably like a hot take about buttons and links back mm -hmm. when the whole um, discussion that happened about TikTok's documentation on using a button versus a link and like there was so much conversation on it and you know there's some tense stuff there obviously because it's twitter mm -hmm. but there were a lot of good conversations that happened i think and where people um got to consider things that they had not considered before mm -hmm. and so i definitely wanted to start with button buttons and links like anchor elements um for sure because those are things that people ask about so much. It's such a common topic. Like, do I use a button here? Do I use a link here? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's definitely where I wanted to start. But beyond that, what I did was I went to W3C, W3 schools, <laughs> W3C, um, W3 schools, and they have a list there of all the HTML elements. And um, that was one place that I looked, and I also looked at MDN, which I think is also linked somewhere. It just depends on what I really want to look at. They mm -hmm. they both have different sets of information. Um, this one is like, I think this one's more condensed or something. I don't really remember. But I just kind of looked through this, and uh, I did learn or was like reminded of some elements that I don't commonly use, and that just, you know, sparks the ideas of it. And um, I picked... For the third set of demos that I want to do, because I want to do more than three, but okay. the third currently that I picked out is going to be the detail summary elements, because I think those are probably so interesting in all the ways that you can use them mm -hmm. and how they sound semantically and things that you can add to those elements to make them sound semantically different. Um, so that's where I really started was like, HTML is the foundation here. Mm -hmm. So let's just take it back all the way back to the foundations and read about this um so that's where i started and then from there you can click on the different tags they have and it will take you to the individual pages okay um so if we go back to w3 schools yes and then click on the button tag i think it's alphabetical order yeah there we go i love the uh simple explanation of defines a clickable button <laughs> i love that stuff it's like going to google and looking mm. for the definition of something and then it uses like the adjective that relates oh, to it yes. in the definition or like vice versa and mm. i'm like okay yeah i don't it, know what that word word means either <laughs> accessibility is the property of being accessible like okay thank you <laughs> exactly. like, like i like know that. i know I, I figured as much <laughs> yeah exactly um so this is like all about documentation reading and I love reading documentation. I like writing okay. documentation too, cause I'm a weirdo, but I love it. Um, and so what I started doing here was reading about the different attributes and this is how I picked the different sets of demos that I want to do um, in the page. I need to actually move my captions over so I can see your tabs better. Oh, here we go. Nice. <laughs> um, so if you go to the, the code, uh, the code pin tab. Yep. There we go. And yes. So pages. Yep. And then demos buttons. So okay. this is a Next.js app. And for anyone who doesn't know how this works, I think Gatsby apps also work like this. You have a pages directory and however you nest things underneath there is going to be the routing of your app. So if you have pages and then index.js or JSX, that's going to be the home page. And if you have a folder like demos and an index.js page, um, there's going to be a page called demos. So we can show that really quick in the sidebar here. Oh, yeah. Um, since, yeah I'll do that in the sidebar. Yep. So, yeah, but since we don't have to use the uh, screen reader yet. But if we go to demos, 
uh, there we go. the code for that page will be there and then it links to button demos and we have a bunch there. So this is what it looks like currently. And this is a work in progress project. Remember everyone, <laughs> I will not be taking feedback currently. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to give feedback, it's totally fine. But, uh, this is a work in progress, like massively work in progress. So. Mm -hmm. There's lots of research that is going into this, and I'm looking up resources that people can reference, and it takes a lot of time and work, but it's fun, mm -hmm. um, and I love it. I love this stuff. I wish I could get, like, paid to do this all the time, and I would just love it so much, but that's not really how the world works, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so all of the attributes that you see in that page we were just looking at, that is how I picked some of these things, and it's not just about the attributes that we're looking at. There's also a lot of concepts that go with these attributes. Um, so autofocus and disabled are both really good examples of like, yes, you have the ability to do these things, but should you? And that's a lot of the stuff that I want to, that I want this website to be good for is to help guide people in making those decisions because yes, there are cases where you can use a disabled button using the disabled property. Mm -hmm. Um, there are cases where you can use the autofocus property, maybe not for a button, but for input sometimes. Yes. Um, and there's so many considerations that come with that. And that's, that's really what I want this to be for. So what autofocus is a, a really fun one that I was enjoying exploring with here. Wikipedia that uses uh -huh. autofocus to take you into the search bar, which you do like skip past the different like language links. But let's be honest, the vast majority of people who are landing on the Wikipedia homepage are just immediately, like, hoping to, like, search for an article, right? So this is one of those times where, like, yes, you exactly. do skip the content, but you get to what 99% of users actually want more immediately. Exactly. So you touched on a lot of those things. Like, what are you skipping? Is it worth skipping? Is there vital information here that's being skipped? Um, if there is, then just don't skip it because mm -hmm. the work that you have to do, like if you have something have autofocus and you also want to describe something above, like yeah. there's so much extra code that goes into that. And is it worth it? Really? There's mm -hmm. more testing you have to do. And anything you do that's outside of the norm has more testing, you know, has higher risk of being buggy and broken. Mm -hmm. And that's why you try to stick to the basics and then build on top of it. And that's why <laughs> there is a rule of ARIA, and it is no ARIA is better than bad ARIA. Mm -hmm. That is in the documentation, and I love it. I even yeah. made a cross stitch of it. <laughs> really? Oh, I man. don't have it nearby. Is it on um, Twitter? Can I find it with Twitter? Oh, I disabled the search thing on Twitter. Never mind. I, I installed an extension that's like, please just hide the right-hand sidebar when I'm streaming, just because, I don't know, uh, that always feels I distracting. I totally find it. Yes, if you find that and stick the no, link in the chat, that would be excellent. I can probably find it pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and it's it's funny that you're mentioning um, should you disable a button, because that's actually the subject of next week's stream, is I've got Sandrina Pereira coming on. We're going to be exploring, like, whether disabling buttons in the first place is, is like, a good user experience or what could be done to make that a better user experience. So uh, if you're curious about that one particular micro-interaction, that's what next week is about. Ooh. I hope I'm not still selling this. Oh my goodness, I am. Okay, um, <laughs> please don't buy one of these because I'm not making them right now, but there's still a link and it says three are available. But don't buy it, please. That's incredible. Um, but, oh, that's that's such a lovely cross stitch. I, I love that. It needs ironed, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I think I ironed it afterwards. It was just like a plain little classic cross stitch thing, and it had mm -hmm. some little leaves on it, and it was nice and simple, and I loved it. Um, I don't have it nearby, though. Mm. I don't even remember where I put it. I feel like I hid it from myself, and now it's really hidden. Oh, man. <laughs> I feel like that, that would be, like, really great for, like, your background, like, like hung up on your wall, like, right behind you, so that, like, you, you've always got, like, some accessibility reminders, like, just behind you. Um bring it out passive aggressively on zoom calls with your coworkers. you know um it only conveniently appears whenever you've like got some coworkers with uh some accessibility i don't know that 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 feels like a bad energy perhaps 
but <laughs> I I do definitely need to work on my streaming background. There like it's very plain. My walls are a little dirty because of like furniture and stuff. Yeah. But <laughs> it's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'll work on it eventually. Yeah, so we've we've got a few demos. Um uh Abdul Rahman, thank you so much for the follow. I really appreciate that. Um yeah, let's let's go ahead and I guess We've got a few demos. Which one would you, would you like to hop into first? Um, let's see. So the basic button one, um, that would be like super good intro for people. Um, there's not a ton here. Oh, and each of these files has the text on the page. So if you click the basic button link in that tab, um, each one of these are set up to have like I don't really want them to be that long in the text because I don't want people to be afraid. So I'm mm. I'm working with the layout of it, you know, that way people can have sections of like, here are related resources if people come back for that. I mean, yeah. they don't have to parse all of it. Um, but that is the basic layout that we have going here is like the top has descriptions and whatnot. And like some of them are many blog posts, like the autofocus one <laughs> and the disabled one. Those are definitely a little mm-hmm. longer. Um, and then at the bottom is uh, the actual elements that uh we can interact with and whatnot. Okay. So this one, see, it's kind of long. <laughs> yeah. You weren't kidding. That's great. Uh, we got. I have a lot of fun with it. This is why it's taking so long because I'm enjoying it a mm-hmm. lot, doing a lot of reading and sharing. <laughs> that's that's incredible. Michael Chan is in the chat saying he loves this site. I agree. I'm super excited for this to launch. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, start with the basic so the, one. Yeah, the basic one is just there to you know. Anyone who's brand new to using a screen reader or whatnot, um, they will get to hear what a button sounds like. And all it's going to say is, click me button. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, what screen reader are you using today? I guess we didn't. So I'm on a Mac, so I'll be that. using um, VoiceOver. Um, let's see. Okay. It is, it's in demos, and that will get me the rest of the way. Uh, I've got this pulled yes. off into another tab. Uh Yes. Just for folks in the audience, if you're ever using Code Pen or a Code Sandbox, um, accessibility testing gets really weird with those because of the way both of those platforms use frames to host your site. Um, and so we, Ashley and I, have just both found that it's so much easier to do these demos when you pull the stuff out to another window. So we will be back uh, right. bouncing back and forth between this window and Code Pen, uh, Code Sandbox, yes. Code Sandbox. Right. Sandbox. I always say code pen because that's just where I started. Yes. Here we go. So, um, yeah. Do you want me to just, I guess, roll over this button with voiceover? Yeah. If you just want to, like, tab over to it or whatever controls you typically use. Cool. Everyone does it differently, I think. So, I'm on a Mac, so I'm turning on voiceover. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to hold command and press my touch ID button three times. That's one of the ways you can turn it on. Um, there's like five different ways you can activate voiceover. Voiceover on Chrome, HTTP entering web content. Visited link, demos, list two items. Visited link, buttons. Click me, button, main. You are currently on a button. To click this button, press control, option, space. All right. That's interesting. It said button main. Is it because it's in a main element? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, cause uh, and it would have it would have basically like this. Actually, you know what? Let me nuke voiceover. Voiceover off. Yeah. Uh, if we inspect the the markup on this, um, yeah. So we were in the nav when we were up here on these, and then oh, the button yeah. is the first thing that we focus on after hopping into the main. So it's like, yes. hey, just so you know, there's a main. You're in a main now. Um, had we gone, okay. had we gone to the H one um, first, then it would have said like H one or heading level one, a basic button main. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Forgot about that. Nice. See, I love this so much. Mm-hmm. This is so much fun. I need to hang out with more accessibility people in my free time. <laughs> we just we need to get like we just need to have a big accessibility uh, advocate party. That's what we need to have. That'd be awesome. I would love that. I can, um, I can just imagine the uh, the the Jackbox uh, like cl- 
play Quiplash to just imagine the, the answers. It's like, how many answers can we just put overlays for? Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so great. I haven't played that game in forever. I love that. Responsibility party. Yep. All right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that was that was a, a pretty quick demo of, of a button. We didn't actually do a whole lot with this button. Um, oh, um, Travis is asking, so does it say main the first time and not after? For instance, if you go to the H1 and then the button will it say main for both. It should just say main once. Yeah. Voice over on Chrome. Entering web content. Here. Click me. Button main. Let me start it. You are current visited link. Demo visited link. Buttons. Chrome and list. End of navigation. You main. You are currently on a main heading level one. A basic button. This is a plain button element with no properties added to it. Nothing happens when it is activated. When focused, your screen reader will say, "Click me button. Click me button." You are currently on a. Yeah. <laughs> voiceover off. So the like that the voiceover experience like just it tacking main on into the end. That's an indication that you've entered the main. You'd probably get an exit also, like maybe not for that specific yeah. element, but I do know it happens on some elements. Yes, end of main or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Yes, I think it happens for sections. That would make sense. I think lists as well do that. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> See, this is fun because like it's impossible to memorize all of this stuff. I just want to point it out. like. Mm -hmm. It's just like code. Like we don't memorize every single function that we need. You know, sometimes we gotta Google it and search mm -hmm. it and just be reminded of how something behaves. And then we're like, oh yeah, that's how it works. And accessibility isn't really that different. It's another facet of development that's extremely important. And mm -hmm. you you learn how to learn things and you can apply those skills to accessibility as well as just as you learn code stuff. Yes, absolutely. This I I, I think that's such a great point um because accessibility can can be one of those things that especially looking in can feel very overwhelming um and i don't know sometimes it's just really good to know like yes you can go to google or you can just kind of go back to the basics and be like just 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 test this run your screen reader over this and figure out what it's actually doing um mm -hmm. and, and figure out then like hey how can i improve it from there you don't have to know everything you just have to know where you find things right and that's kind of the process of these demos too. Like when I build something as a front end developer, if I'm building a component, I start very bare bones, very basic. I need to know how does this like work out of the box? How does it sound out of the box? And my dog is chewing a bone. You guys can probably hear it. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> how rude <laughs> um so i start very bare bones and like i slowly add to stuff and that's how i learn things like i'll add something mm -hmm. and then i need to know is it working differently how exactly is it doing it so i have a very very iterative mm -hmm. approach um i'm a very systematic person anyway so like that's part of just how my brain needs to do things to process what i'm doing mm -hmm. um but it's really helpful I have found when learning something new, like add one thing, what changed? If I add something different, how does it change in a different way than the other thing that I added? Why does it do that? And you just got to do Googling from there. Like yeah. there's so much Googling that you have to do when you learn something and it's okay to not know something also. Like mm -hmm. it's okay to say, I don't know, but I'll learn. Like that's the important part is the effort that you put into learning it and being transparent about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other half of that is like acknowledging that like you're not going to come at a perfect solution you're, you're, that's just, there's no such thing as a perfect solution all the time and so being willing to perform like user testing where possible right to, to figure out what are the gaps that people are encountering and when is the theoretically correct answer actually hindering the user experience as, as well right and uh, another like philosophical thing that we've got here that this gets into is that disabled people often have conflicting access needs, yes. you know, and so that's where personalization is really important. So when it comes to things like captions, we need them because we both can't repeat here. So we need captions, but that can be really distracting to other people mm -hmm. who, um, 
are just looking at that and they can't focus on what's going on. So the personalization there is enabling people to turn those on and off on their right. own and empowering people to do what they need to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Another example of those kind of conflicting accessible needs is uh, actually color contrast, right? Because if you are uh, low vision or if you're colorblind, like having high contrast is hugely beneficial. But if contrast is too high, this could be overstimulating uh, to, for instance, autistic people. So, uh, the yeah, that, that personalization aspect is huge. Yeah. So, all right. Um, what's the what's the next thing we're doing, Ashley? Um, so if you go back a page, I they're in alphabetical order in the folder, so like that's not really like uh, the logical order that I'm taking. Um, and I actually did make these a little bit. I do not want to talk about autofocus first. I'll have to move that. Um, let's talk about disabling buttons because that is such a fascinating mm -hmm. topic that I did not know a lot about until I started doing more research. Um, so disabled buttons, uh, when you use the disabled property on a button, it removes it from the, I am losing the words, the, um, focus order. Yeah. The tab order. I don't think order is the word I'm looking for, but sure. it removes it from the list of things that are tabbable in a document basically. Um, and so if you have a form that is disabled in the button like to save it or submit it is disabled because the form isn't valid you can't really get to that knowledge like just by tabbing through the form mm -hmm. and so if someone can't see that it's disabled or that the button text is different because it's not reachable by keyboard then there's context that's being missed out on so that's where it's a little bit more work, not a ton of work. It's very valuable work. You use something like ARIA Disabled instead, and mm -hmm. you change the styles of the button. And um, what I learned a lot about this is like when you show error messages um, and that instead of disabling a button, let the button be clicked, show the error messages, mm -hmm. put that in like an ARIA or in a live region so that it's presented um whenever it's whenever the form is submitted and just making sure that all of the words that you have there make sense and they're very informative so that people know exactly what's happening as if you had your eyes closed and like someone was just saying it to you which feels kind of ironic to say as a deaf person because mm -hmm. <laughs> if i close my eyes i cannot understand anything at all um, unless i have headphones on so that's mm -hmm. why i have headphones on um but that is a much better and uh, usable practice for people, um, especially people who use assistive technologies to navigate pages or to like listen to a screen reader to have it presented to them. And um, that's that's the approach that I was using with that. So if you hit the save, I don't know why it doesn't go away. Yeah. <laughs> the message, um, it should be in an ARIA Live. Yeah, yes, let's let's ARIA Live spam. Let's uh, do this over here on um, our other tab. So it's disabled is what it's called. Um, by the way, I wanted to shout out Alan. Uh, Alan, thank you so much for subscribing. Um, just so y'all know, um, subscribing, uh, that, that sub money is going towards um, me funding closed captions for these streams so that I can get uh, the uploads out faster. So just so you know, like if you subscribe, that's the cause that it's going to is ensuring that um, I can sustainably and quickly turn around the recordings with captions uh, and keep them accessible for all. So thank you all for subscribing. Um, all right, let me turn on voiceover and then we'll go ahead and uh, do this button. Voiceover on drone, HTTPS. And I'm just going to skip down closer to the end. I, I is can, unselected. You are currently on a text. Okay. So first of all, we're going to see that like I cannot tab to, let me move this over a bit. I can't tab to the click me button. Um, and so that's the first thing that we're going to see. And then the second thing we're going to see is what happens when I click the save changes button. Link, live regions, save changes, dim button. Chrome has new window. You are currently on a. Okay. So it's saying that this is a dimmed button. Why is it saying it's dimmed? 
I'm pretty sure that comes from the Aria disabled um, uh, property because I can't remember exactly what it was, um, but different screen readers present it differently. Mm -hmm. So voiceover says dimmed, and I think a different screen reader, I don't remember which one exactly because it's probably on Windows and I don't have <laughs> Windows. Um, so I haven't done a lot of practice with it, but it uses a different word, uh, mm -hmm. which is a good thing to bring up that all screen readers work differently. And some screen readers cost money, a lot of money, depending on where you're from, like what country you're from, even. We're not pointing so, fingers, Jaws. <laughs> nope, not pointing fingers. Um, and they can be complex to use. And just because there's so many things that you can do, because customizing things is very difficult for everyone that needs to use something like a screen reader. So this is these are just important contextual notes that I'm bringing up here. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to now go ahead and, uh, you know, press this button. Um, and I think I actually have to try this again because I've been playing with moving around this box. Uh, let me try that real quick. Link. Live. Save changes. Dimmed button. Cannot save. Input is not valid. Okay. So we pressed it and immediately after it said cannot save. Input is not valid. And you said that was because we were using an ARIA live region. Yes. Those are so neat. Um, so if we look at the code, I yes. think what I'm doing is a bit redundant there because um, I've since learned more about ARIA Live. But what I have there is a message. That message is what's getting rendered inside of the span that has mm -hmm. ARIA Live set on it. And that span is only getting rendered if um, there mm -hmm. is a message. And I don't think that is necessary as far as I understand how ARIA Live regions work. If the text yeah. changes, it is presented, is my understanding. Sorry, I've been looking for a moment to uh, shut off voiceover just because it always interrupts. So let me do that real quick. Voiceover off. There we go. Streaming while <laughs> demoing voiceover is always an adventure. Um, it yeah. so is. <laughs> um, especially when there's like a, a guest where it's like, oh, I really want to let the guest talk because that's the important part. But also, like, I can't move windows until I shut down voiceover um, <laughs> i'll try to remember that uh it was i was on uh learn with jason uh, a couple months ago and and that was this constant thing of like i remembered and so it's like every time voiceover happened like i remembered to shut up and then jason's like oh no sorry don't let me interrupt and it's like no no i i just i know that this is just a part of streaming accessibility stuff um okay <laughs> so live ah here oh it's at the top demo. okay so you yes yes you've got this uh First of all, here's our ARIA disabled. So that's what gave us that dimmed announcement, as opposed to this button that has the like just native disabled attribute. Um, so we saw we can see why those differences were there. Um, and now you're conditionally rendering this ARIA live region. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen is um, this works in voiceover with where you're conditionally rendering this node, but I think um, as per the specs, ARIA Live regions are supposed to be like present on the DOM before you add any messaging to them. So conditional rendering happens to work with VoiceOver because of the way that VoiceOver is implemented and the accessibility tree on Mac is implemented. But I think ideally you're supposed to have this on the page like all the time and you would populate it later, if that makes sense. Right. And if the text changes, so like if you didn't like clear the text and then set the text, yes. I don't think you have to do that. I think you can just change it and it just works. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could try it if we want to. Okay. Um, yeah. So what happens when I type in here? I think that um, actually, yeah, because you've got yeah. Um, let me yeah. You want to go? Oh, ahead am and... I there? I think I think so. I think oh, hey, <laughs> uh -huh. nice. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you got what we can do here, let's first take out the conditional rendering. So I'm just going to copy that and paste it. And when I hit save, it has prettier and it auto formats, which is like, I can't live without prettier. <laughs> <laughs> um, this class name screen reader only, I'm pretty sure that doesn't actually do anything right now. And that is from a blog post. Oh my goodness. Who is it? Is it? So there's like so many different articles floating out there, but the one I typically use is Scott O'Hara's Inclusively Hidden. Um, yes, I think, and I think he links to the one I'm thinking of. I think Kitty Geraldle has one as well. And yeah, they're, like everyone has their own um, ver 
version of like a blog post that shares this. I don't see a link here, but I'll I'll stick this link because this is what I tend to use in the the okay. chat. Great. Uh, there we go. But yeah, so uh, this is actually. Do you want to uh, kind of explain why we need a class like this? Um, wait. What? Can you repeat that? Oh, do you want to? Uh, could you explain why we need a class like SR only or visually hidden or or some sort of utility like this? Um. Yeah. So, an ARIA live region, like it depends on what you're using it for. So if in this kind of example that we've been talking about with a form where when you submit the form, you show error messages, that is beneficial for both um, people who can visually see the page and people who are using assistive technology to consume the page. So we don't really need that here. Mm -hmm. I think this is like just a work in progress, like bit of code and I just didn't delete it. Um, so with something like this, we don't necessarily need it. Um, and I can't think of a specific example of an ARIA live region um, unless you're like stating that something happened on the page and mm -hmm. you don't really need to show that text. Yeah. But that is what that's for. When you, when something visually happens, um, you need to like convey that to someone who's using a screen reader or assistive technology, um, but you don't need to display that text at all. But the only way you can like put it in the markup so that it's red is like you put it in there and you have to hide it. There are, are a lot of considerations that you have to make for hiding, like with browser compatibility mm -hmm. and um, not even just individual browsers, but like versions of browsers and all of the different assistive technologies that are out there on different OSs. So like this is why so many people have written about it is because mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of ways to do it. And like we need it super documented, and I hope I remember who wrote that. I can think of their web page, and I know what it looks like. But Jimmy Grotto, think. Hang on. Uh, I think. Oh. Exclusively hidden. What? Hiding content responsibly. Is this it? Yeah. Okay. So this is the specific one that shows the um, screen reader only class, but I think this links to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, this is a, a great place. So if you want to okay. link this, um, this is exactly what I was thinking of, actually. And it's a beautiful site. Yeah, they very, did a great very job. Very clean and classy. <laughs> um, so that's where I got this from. And I think I have this in separate notes in a different app that I had actually started this project in. So mm -hmm. this will definitely be shared with the... <laughs> Uh, end product. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, so we're not going to do it here. Okay. So I don't think we need to copy it and paste it or anything. Um, all it would be doing is hiding it so you don't see it. But I think it's, I think it's valuable for this demonstration purpose to see it pop up. So I'm going to delete yeah. that. Just yeah. Don't confuse me. So broadly uh, speaking, um, if you need to have content that is um, available to screen readers and other assistive technologies, but you don't want that to be visually shown. Um, you don't want to use something like display none or visibility hidden because browsers take that as a cue of like, oh, no one's supposed to get this. So I'm not even going to expose it to assistive technology. So that's why you need a class like this is it's basically a CSS hack that makes the content like really small or at least the window through which you could see the content like impossibly small so it's not technically hidden it's basically effectively hidden um and and this mm -hmm. is the like go-to trick for having content that is um accessible via assistive technologies but still visually completely hidden yes thank you for elaborating on that no problem um so what we were doing here we're gonna check and see what happens if we change the message right without clearing it yes Okay, so that's what I will do. So the first thing that we have is it waits two seconds to put this message in here. And this is not ideal code here, all right? We're just doing it. I don't like timeouts. Timeouts are usually gross. They're usually a code smell unless they are very intentionally used. Usually you have to like have a delay on something mm -hmm. like in a test and I don't like timeouts that much. <laughs> so we're going to add another timeout inside of a timeout because... This is sarcasm. This is what we need to do. <laughs> but I would not do this in production code, probably okay. not. 
Um, I really don't know what to make it say. We're testing. <laughs> Are you live stuff? Okay. Oh, wait, I need to add a timeout on there. So um, what we should see is the behavior that we saw before. So cannot save input is not valid. And then two seconds later, we should be read. We're testing ARIA live stuff. That's what we're hoping for. All right. We're, we're trying to prove some hypothesis, a, a hypothesis. There we go. Um, and I think, I think you probably saved. Yeah, it looks like you saved. So this should work now. Turning on voiceover again. Voiceover on drone, entering web content. Link, live regions, main, save changes, dimmed button. You are currently on a button. This item is dimmed. Cannot save. Input is not valid. We're testing all your live stuff. Nice. It works. I love it. Also, the stream reader sounded so excited. We're testing all your live stuff. <laughs> Woo! Go all your live. <laughs> I love it. Also, uh, y'all are being hilarious in the chat. Um, the ID... The id of Alan, the ID of Alan, I don't know. Um, it said timeouts all the way down and then building bedrock layout. Said, I heard you like timeouts, so I timed out my timeout. <laughs> this is great. I love it when the chat messes with me. I've streamed before also, mm -hmm. so like you guys aren't going to offend me unless you actually say something super offensive. So <laughs> I can take it. I can take it from the chat. I am not going to encourage that. <laughs> Right, so I'm okay. There we go. Well, no. <laughs> Voice over off. Uh, no, have, have I guess have at it? Question mark. Uh, <laughs> Don't be mean. We we gotta have positive vibes here. Positive vibes. Um. All right. Yeah. So, I yeah, that was. I think this is a a really nice demo of just showing like the the difference between these these two buttons and also getting to play around with Aria Live. I actually wonder now how. It might be feasible. I'm sure somewhere down the road you're gonna have a set of demos that are specifically just like, here's all the things to know about like Aria Live or Live Regions in general. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we got Brent is uh, calling out your cross stitch for being dorky, but in Yay, a good way. That's of course. The goal. <laughs> I'm basically like a grandma and like a 26 year old body. So I like. Um, the golden girls i like cross stitching i like knitting like my body feels like it's falling apart all the time and it doesn't cooperate with me so like it's the grandma like okay. it's fine i love dorky stuff disability experience time do you find that when you have one disability you really have three disabilities oh hell yeah yeah this is a, a thing that i think like non-disabled people don't necessarily like understand about disability is like it's never just one thing it's always three things like you, you always have like a laundry list of, of it's things. really not like i'm deaf so my ears don't really work but there are like things that go with that like i have tinnitus all the time and it actually kind of hurts sometimes and uh like sometimes they'll give me a migraine and also like disabilities are just so freaking annoying and bodies are annoying so I need hearing aids to hear mm -hmm. stuff, but I put them in and it's just too loud. So then I have a migraine and it's like, what, this doesn't add up. Like I'm giving you what you need. Right. Why won't you cooperate? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. For, forget like disabled people in general, having conflicting needs, like disabled person has conflicting needs. <laughs> so true. Oh God. Literally all the time. Like, there's so many things. Mm -hmm. My migraines, I have so many of those triggers, and they just conflict with everything. Uh, but... Angry Moose on the Loose says, I came into bodies are annoying, um, which is one heck of a time to come in. Uh, congratulations, <laughs> Angry Moose. Uh, we, are, uh, we are actually uh, going through a few HTML demos just to really understand, like, how, like, what is a systematic approach for, for understanding, like, how do we test differences in semantic markup and um like kind of incrementally add the experience that we want um yes so speaking of uh what's kind of the next thing you wanted to take a look at ashley um yeah so we've taken a look at some demos and there are there's all kinds of stuff and we could literally talk about it forever like mm -hmm. i love talking about accessibility love it love it um but we only have a few more minutes really is there a dog behind there you? is a dog <laughs> welcome dog <laughs> <laughs> that's true, Fred. <laughs> we 
hunters are. <laughs> That's so funny. Don't you worry, never my get cat's to my over. Streams. My cat Tuna is over there, just like conked out on the bed, like hard at work, of course. <laughs> yes, they are both doing that now. They're laying down. I have two dogs, by the way. Um, so we don't have a ton of time to like dig into more demos, but mm -hmm. um, I want to talk more about my process, like what I would do next. So yeah. if they we had all this stuff and like. From a front end development perspective, I'm going to build a new component. Where do I go to look this up? My favorite, probably one of my favorite websites um, or pages, is the W3 or the YARIA authoring practices. Yeah. I love it. They have such good examples there. Um, so, in the sidebar, they call these things widgets and not components. And, you know, whatever you call it is fine. Um, and they have design patterns, so it gets into some abstract stuff uh, and generalized stuff, um, and it gets into, like, what is a dialogue, and, you know, what are the different kinds of dialogues? You know, some interrupt a user's flow, and some don't, and you have to know exactly what you want with that, and it talks about, um, in some of these examples and whatnot, like, why you would choose one or not and the other. So... Um, depending on the kind of person you are, I wouldn't recommend like just diving in and reading this. Like mm -hmm. you're not going to remember a ton of it probably until you need it. Um, knowing the layout of this document is very good. That way you can come back to it later and easily get to what you need. But typically what I like to do if I'm building a new component is I will go here and I will see, is there something similar to what I want to do? So if I'm building um, some kind of menu, like I'm going to be building a menu at work soon, I think. I don't really know. <laughs> um, but menus are one that I think about a lot. Um, so there are different kinds of menus that show up here. But when you when you click on them, the way this document is laid out is they have examples and they get into lists of like keyboard navigation and they have these tables that just lay out everything, like exactly what you need, what elements they're using, what should happen, um, you know, if a button is focused and you hit a certain key, what's supposed to happen? And they get into all of the attributes and states and properties that you need. And um, what's nice about this is they have the code rendered on the page also. So you can interact with it and use it as like, this is what it needs to do. What I'm building needs to sound like this. And it's really helpful in that case. Like, it's a great reference in my experience. Um, What's important to note here is that there are a whole bunch of ways to make something accessible, not only because, you know, conflicting access needs and whatnot, but just because there are a lot of approaches that you can take to end up with the same result in a lot of cases, not in every single case, but um, just like we can all say things differently to each other because that's how language works. It's the same way with a screen reader, um, which is why it's important to actually test with people and say, is this mm -hmm. useful? to yeah. you as a screen reader user um that's super important user testing is so important um so this is a resource that i i love using um it is also important to note like in a side they do have a button widget which tells you how to build a button out of a div and do not do this for all of your buttons <laughs> use a button element but what that can be helpful for is applying the knowledge that you need for making something clickable um, mm -hmm. to work like a button. So like if you have um, like a card or something like that on a blog post, and when you click on the card, it will take you to a uh, the actual blog post instead of having to click a very specific link, you know, like you can increase your touch target size, which is good for accessibility in a lot of cases. Um, it will tell you, it teaches you the concepts of doing something like that. Like, don't build a button from scratch. Like, there's so mm -hmm. much you can give her free out of the box. It's so much easier. But there are attributes that you apply to an element to make it clickable and to convey that to users. And that's what you can learn from these examples. Right. Um, are there other resources you like to go to, or are the ARIA authoring practices kind of the main, like, first, like, place you look at? Um, since I know, like, of other documents, this is often where I go, since I've, like, seen other ones, because as you can see from the view we're looking at now, there are links to the different 
thing. So like Aria pressed this one, Aria has pop-ups. So this links to a lot of further documentation if you want to read more deeply mm -hmm. about the different role states and properties that are in Aria. But I also really like a general resource, which is um, the A11Y project. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's A11YProject.com. Yeah. I love this site. Tatiana um, did such a great job with the design. Yes, it, the design is fantastic, and I love that it just s dispels the myth that accessibility means ugly. Like, it doesn't mm -hmm. whatsoever. You can create beautiful designs that are accessible, and it's so good, and I love it. Uh, but this site is really great for finding further resources. Um, mm -hmm. They do have articles on here that are really helpful, but um, there is a resources page, and it gets into different... Um, what word am I thinking of? Mediums. So that's really accessible because I don't listen to podcasts a lot personally because I have to be in the right setting and I have to have headphones and mm -hmm. it's just, I don't often find myself in the setting where I can listen to podcasts. Um, so I don't typically look at that, but other people really like podcasts. So I think there's podcasts listed here and books and blogs and um this is a long YouTube, one. Like talks. Out. Yeah. So I think at the top left, there is a, um, like a table of contents oh, yeah. type thing. Looks like it. Yes. Yeah, so Ooh. it also breaks things up into different sections. Like there's tools and all kinds of stuff. This is like really good stuff that's been collected for a while. Um, mm -hmm. The person who curates this, their, their name is completely... Eric Bailey. Yes. Eric Bailey um, is the main person that runs this, and it's been going for a while. I don't know how many years. It's been multiple years because I knew about it when I started reading about accessibility and whatnot. Um, so it's a fantastic collection of resources that you can go to to learn even more. Um, and then, of course, the... Uh, okay, so I want to know how other people say this. I... I say like WCAG in my head. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so the guidelines, the WCAG web content accessibility guidelines, like that's a really good place too. Um, I think it can be very intimidating to see that. Yeah. But the number, I am skipping the number on my head. Is it 12 or 13 total guidelines? I feel like there's 14 now, maybe with uh, 2.1 or 2.2 or something like that. Something like that. Right. Okay. So there's roughly a dozen total guidelines. And when you think about it from that perspective, that's not a ton. There are just a lot of things underneath each one yeah. that you have to learn about. But overall, that's what you need to understand. Like, obviously, if you get an accessibility job, you need to know specifics, like whatever they tell you, you need to know. But mm -hmm. to get started, learn what the guidelines are, learn what the I think the four principles are, which are poor, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Did I get it? <laughs> you got it. Got it in one. I got it. <laughs> Heck yeah. Um, so like you, you start at the, the, the top of, or the bottom, I guess, the foundation, and then you go from there. So that's where a systematic approach comes in. And that's what I hope the main takeaway is here, you know, that you feel a little more empowered and um, less intimidated by accessibility. Like you have some starting places and you're mm -hmm. like, okay, yeah, I can just open a code pen and try out some attributes. Like that's pretty easy. That's not yeah. any different than the rest of my code. So that's what I hope a major takeaway is here. Like mm -hmm. experimenting can be easy. It can be fun. It's okay if you don't know everything. Like it's all positive vibes here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for, for coming on. I've really had, I've really appreciated having you on. Um, and chat, thank you all so much for being here as well. Um, if talking about these kinds of interactions, especially from an accessibility framework is interesting to you, then you're uh, really going to love next week's stream. I've got Sandrina Pereira coming on. We're going to be exploring specifically uh, how to inclusively disable a button. So really focusing on that micro interaction that we've already alluded to several times today. So 
uh, you'll want to be there for that. That's next Tuesday at 12 p.m. Central. Um, same place, same time. Um, and yeah, with that, I think, actually, you know what? I'm going to do one more shout out for your Twitter. Um, Thanks. At Ashley M. Boyer. And while I'm here, I might as well promote the Semantics Twitter account as well. Go follow that for updates on all the, the different streams that are going on. Um, and yeah, stick around. I'm going to try to find someone to raid. If you've got anyone you want to see raided, uh, let me know in the chat. Um, but y'all, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you once more, Ashley, for, for joining the stream. Thanks for having me. Bye, y'all.